The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Well, the grass will wither, the flower will fade, but the word of our God endures forever. You may be seated. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would send forth your word like the rain. That as it falls on the thorn and thistle infested hearts that we all have. We pray that it would bear fruit. That in the places where thistles and thorns grow, cypress trees would sprout, as your word in Isaiah says. Father, we ask yet again for you to conform us more into the likeness and the image of our Savior. We pray this in his name. Amen. Well, it is a joy and a privilege to open God's Word with you this Lord's Day. I will give a fair warning uh, this week. My wife is 37 and a half weeks along. So if I don't show up on a Sunday or if I get a call here and close in prayer, you'll know why. So we are very excited for uh, welcoming our third daughter into the world, hopefully soon. And uh, my wife is very excited to, uh, to not be pregnant anymore. And uh, so we'll just continue preaching through 1 Timothy as long as uh, we're here. And I'm hoping that Pastor Kelly gets the text on whether or not deaconesses are a thing or not. But he's also hoping and praying that uh, my wife holds out until I've preached that. One of our desires as we look at 1 Timothy is that God would use his word to transform the life of our church into uh, what we ought to be. We are not interested in the thoughts of men. We are not interested in newer schemes or fads or men's ideas or men's rationale as to how church should go. It is not like there are multiple authorities that speak into what life as a church should be. There is only one authority. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. He and he only is king of the church. And he and he only gets to uh, command or prescribe what church life should look like. So we're not wanting to import any of our own ideas. What we're wanting is to open the Word of God together as a church family and say, Lord, teach us what church life ought to look like. Starting uh, last week, we, we looked at half of the requirements for an elder. So uh, what, do, what, what does church office look like? Who should fill those roles? And as you said last week, and I'll repeat it again this week, when we're done with this section on elders and we're done with the section on deacons, if you as a member of the church say, you know what, I think this person fits those qualifications and I would love it if they would be considered by the elders um, and examined by the elders for that cause, we would love for you to come and tell us who you think that is. And we would love for the Lord to raise up faithful elders and faithful deacons in our midst to um, faithfully serve this church. As we look at the qualifications for church officers. As I said last, uh, last Lord's Day, what we're, what we're looking at is not a list of super Christian qualities. What we're looking at are a mature, a mature Christian. 
And sometimes if, if we're just not careful, we can start looking at a list like we find in chapter 3, verses 1 through oh, about 13, where we look at officers of the church, and we see all of the things listed, and we can start to, in our minds, as we trace out the contours of a Christian maturity, we'll call it, it can quite easily become an impersonal, detached, cold standard that will far from a delight and much closer to a burden. We can start to look at the things in this text and, and hear them pile up one after the other. I mean, we looked at seven positive things that an elder should be. Uh, today we'll look at four negatives and then three categories. And it can just start to pile up as this giant, impersonal, detached list that we, we start checking boxes over. And I think it's dangerous for us to detach what we find in this text from the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Often when we talk about mature Christians or we talk about uh, obeying the law of God, I know that both of those are not really popular topics, we can start to think of it as a burden and we can lose sight of the person to whom we're called to be. All that we're seeing in this text, or when we talk about a robust, faithful, mature Christian life, we're simply talking about Christ-likeness. We're talking about a sinner's life being brought more and more into conformity to a person, the person of Jesus Christ. So please don't lose sight of that. This is not to fan the flame of legalism or pride. It can quickly become that if we start making it a, a list to check rather than a person to be conformed into. So what we all want as Christians, whether you are new in the faith or been in the faith for a long time or, and are somewhere on that spectrum, what we should all be desirous of is that God would, in every area of our life, in our thoughts, in our words, our motives, our actions, our intentions, in every arena, we want Christ more fully formed in us. That's what we want. And we gather together as a church, not as a bunch of hypocrites who say we have it all together. Quite contrary. We do not have it all together. We have not arrived at, at perfect maturity in the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have it all figured out. So those who say the church is full of hypocrites, yes, that is one of our shortcomings. We're hypocrites on top of it. But we all, I trust here at King's Cross, say, you know what? My life is not in conformity, and I greatly desire it to be brought into conformity. And far from a vacation that brings it about, it is hard. Conformity to Christ is difficult, at times painful, at times joy-filled, but difficult too. So keep Christ in, in the midst of your mind as we're looking at this. Keep, as I believe Paul would have us keep it from Colossians 1.28, he says, uh, him, and he's talking about Christ, him we proclaim. Now notice the, the, the outflow of that. We proclaim Christ as a church warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. And that teaching, that warning, that um, proclaiming all has an end in mind. It's going somewhere. And Paul says that end is that we may present everyone mature in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our goal here at King's Cross. That's why we preach the word week in. And week out, we are convinced that God uses his word to change his people. His word empowered by the Holy Spirit, applied to the heart, to change us more into his likeness and image. Now, as we consider the office of overseer or elder, or as I made the airtight case for last week, bishop, but still not, still not hanging on at all. Just continue to ride that dead horse until something comes along. But... The oversight, this is our big idea for today, it's the same as last week. The oversight of the bride of Jesus Christ, overseeing that bride, being a church elder, is, yes, a high honor, but it is a terrifying responsibility. 
So the question must be asked, what kind of person does God set over his church? Last week, we looked at uh, seven positive aspects that must be true of an elder. And today, we want to answer that question under four headings. Might sound like a lot. It is. Um, The first is this, qualifications for an elder in the negative. We looked at the positive, what he must be. And today, we want to look at, starting with, four negatives. Now, we'll look at four negatives, and then we will consider his house, uh, his maturity, and his reputation outside of the home. The f- so, the first point we'll look at today is qualifications put in the negative. Look at the scripture in front of you, verse 3 of chapter 3. What kind of people does God put over his bride? What kind of person does he install in that office and say, here is my blood purchased bride. Watch over her, lead her, guide her, direct her, instruct her. That is a weighty task. Now, what kind of person does he put? Well, first, that kind of a person, an elder, cannot be a drunkard. He cannot be someone who is given to an excess of alcohol. Another way that it's stated under, I believe it's for the deacons, it says they are not addicted to wine. It's the same sense, that they are not those who who are given to an excess of alcohol. Now notice, this does not say that they do not drink alcohol. It says that they don't get drunk with it. That's a key difference. The Bible does not condemn alcohol as an evil substance. In fact, it says, if anything, it is a gift from God used or to be used for the glory of God. There's reasons it was worked into the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. There's reasons why it was the, an abundance of wine was to mark the coming of Messiah. That's why Jesus, in his first miracle, made an abundance of wine. It's his saying... The reign of Messiah is here, and the mountains, as Isaiah said, will drip wine. The gift is not bad. In fact, the gift is good. But when good gifts are made into God's, that's the problem. And so it is not saying that an elder is, not, is someone who doesn't drink any alcohol. It's saying an elder is someone who doesn't get drunk or is not controlled by it. Now, some, we've said this before, would, would take that, and perhaps you've, you have uh, heard this reasoning before, and they do what we would call drawing a fence around it. So they would say, well, an elder cannot be a drunkard, and so, um, so we'll draw a fence around the, the law, which should remind you of someone that we find in the New Testament, or lots of persons, Uh, And they would say, so um, if I never drink alcohol, I can never get drunk. I guess that is a truism. Um, But I I think we should be very concerned when we start drawing fences around the law of God. Now, if an individual man says, hey, um, I don't even want to go there. That's his own decision. That That is his conscience, and he ought to obey that. But I don't think that there should be policies put in place where we draw fences around the law. I mean, could you imagine uh, some of the consequences of that? Some of the folks who would draw the fence around the law or the, the ruling for alcohol, they, they don't draw the same fence around the buffet table, right? Do we stay away from food out of fear of gluttony? No, we, we don't. Do we stay, you know, there are good gifts and they ought to be used in temperance. An elder or mature Christian in the topic of alcohol and other areas should show that proper use of a good gift. So he's not to be a drunkard. If he is a drunkard, he is what the Bible calls a fool. Here at King's Cross, we come down very hard where the Bible comes down very hard. And if a, if a man or woman is given to an excess of alcohol or addiction to any substance, the Bible robustly calls them a fool who's intent on burning their own life to the ground. So we don't take a soft view on alcohol. What we're saying is, in this area, he must be watchful, just as any Christian should be watchful just as any Christian should take 
the good gifts of God and enjoy them as gifts and not make them into gods. Anyone who uh, abuses alcohol, the Bible says, is just an utter fool. And that is a sin to be, a grievous sin to be repented of. The second negative quality is that he is not violent. You can see that in the, the second aspect of verse 3. Not a drunkard and not violent, but gentle. And so there, there's a negative and a positive here. And I believe in the context, what we're seeing with the use of that word violent, it has to do with physical violence. We'll see verbal violence here show up in just a minute, but he is not a fighter, literally, is, is the way that the Greek says it. He is not a fighter. He does not use physical force. And I think you could go from physical force easily into uh, physical intimidation. He neither is violent nor threatens violence. You might say, well, that just seems like really obvious. I would say that there are circumstances in counseling where that temptation is real. <laughs> just being honest. But you are not to be a fighter. There's times where you are talking with uh, some wayward husbands or something like that, and you go, you know, Lord, thank you for guarding here <laughs> that violence is not to be something we engage in. They are not to use their bodies to impose or to overpower or to intimidate those around them. That is not the way that Christ ruled. It's not the way that his under shepherds should rule. They're to be gentle. Now, when you read that word gentle, you might say, okay, well, I, I think we have an understanding of what gentle is. Maybe our minds are, are drawn first and foremost to Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, where the Lord says, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, I'm, I'm gentle and lowly of heart, and you'll find rest. When I think of that, yeah, that, that's an aspect of it. It's actually a different word, gentle, than the one we have in our text. In aspect, but not not a one-to-one. -one. Or maybe you think of 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, where Paul says that he was gentle among you like a nursing mother. That's certainly aspect too, but, but again, a different word. In fact, the word that Paul uses here, it's not a word he used in those other contexts. It's quite a unique one. And the sense is, yes, of gentleness, or what we could call strength, under control. It's not weakness. Gentleness is not weakness. It is strength properly applied, but it also has to do with graciousness. So if, if I were to kind of come up with a made-up word, it'd be like graciously gentle would be kind of the sense of the word. As one commentator says, it is not insisting on every right of letter of law or of custom. It is yielding, gentle, kind, courteous, tolerant. It is the quality of making allowances despite facts that might suggest a reason for a different reaction. An elder that leads the church should not be someone who is always pushy on his own rights. And it, this is just basic to the Christian life, isn't it? Isn't this how Paul says love is defined? Love in 1 Corinthians 13, 5 is not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It isn't irritable or resentful. Friends, what we're finding over and over again is not that a super Christian is being described but a mature Christian, every Christian is called by God's word to not be a drunkard. Every Christian is called by God's word not to be a, a, a fighter or a brawler. Every Christian is called to, like their Savior, be gentle, not a people who insist on our own rights, but are gracious and gentle in family interactions. The church is, among other things, a group of sinners. And what do sinners tend to do towards one another? Sin. And is that easy to deal with? It's not. No, no one in this room likes being sinned against. 
but we will sin against one another, and we do sin against one another. Now, what do we need in, in the continuance of that body life? We need gentleness and graciousness to mark our interactions. You might say, well, well why? Well, the first reason would be God has commanded it. And the second reason would be, this is the way that Christ deals with you. Christ laid aside his riches and honors and the things that were owed him to come and put on a servant's towel to serve you. And the call then is for every Christian and the elders to lead the way in this to likewise don the servant's towel and graciously, patiently, gently live with one another in peace. That is what we are called by God's word to do. Paul will reiterate this in Titus 3 verse 2. Speak evil of no one. Avoid quarreling. Be gentle and show courtesy towards all people. It is easier. <laughs> I was about to say it was easy. It was easier. It is easier to be gentle when you're not being sinned against. Oh, how difficult it is when you're being sinned against. But that does not negate our call to be gentle with each other. Christians, we are not to be fighters. Elders, especially so. Especially so. The third negation or the third negative aspect of an elder is to not be quarrelsome. If the last one had to do with uh, physical violence, this one would, do, would have to do with verbal fighting. An elder should not be quick to draw his verbal sword. An elder should not be a person with that hair trigger on his tongue. An elder should not be one who at the slightest update or alert or whatever, give way to vehement warrioring via the keyboard or keypad or however it works. He is not to be a verbal fighter. Now, does an elder fight verbally for the truth of God's word? Yes, he does, but there's a difference between um, what we would call in English being pugnacious versus being tenacious. The tenacious man, which, which scripture calls us to, is someone who says, this is God's word, this is true doctrine, this is the gospel, and I will contend for this. I will lovingly, but I will rebuke for this. I, I, I will fight for this, and, and it will be of a verbal nature. I will get into Hopefully, gracious, but at times very firm conversations for the truth. And I'm not going to back down from it. I'm not going to apologize that we believe the things about God that we believe. That's being tenacious. An elder needs to be that. But pugnacious is someone who's willing to fight over the silliest, stupidest thing. I know stupid's probably not a word some kids are allowed to say. Um... The dumbest things. We'll fix it with that. <laughs> it's all they'll take away from this sermon is that he said the S word. We are not to be verbally throwing jabs. Is the tongue the most unruly of creatures? Yes. And what does the um, heart speak out of? The tongue. So what is God calling first elders, and I believe second, all Christians, if you read the book of James, it's the same limitation. We are not to be a pugnacious people. Elders firstly, but the congregation as well. We are not to be a people running around the internet getting in fights with each other over the craziest, dumbest stuff. We're not to be a people who take passive-aggressive jabs at each other. Titus 3, verse 
9, avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, quarrels over the law. For they are unprofitable and worthless. If you're quick to get into a verbal fight, you should not be an elder. If you're quick to get into a verbal fight, you need to grow in your Christian maturity on this topic. This is, that is a hard one. <laughs> Fourthly, they're not to be a lover of money. These are all under the four negations or uh, negative qualities that elders should possess. They are not to be a lover of money. Now, you may think, I'm not tempted to be a lover of money. I don't have much of it. Well, that, that's not... It might be true, but um, you can love money and be rich, and you can love money and be poor. The balance on your bank account does not tell me or anyone else whether you love money or not. That is an issue that resides in the heart. Uh, it, it's hard to unpack this phrase because it, the, the meaning lies just right on top of the surface. Do not be a person who finds their security or their satisfaction, or their fulfillment based on wealth. I mean, you can just review in your mind all the things that Christ said about those who serve a master. It will either be God, or a big contender for it will be money. The only other time this word is used in all of the New Testament is Hebrews 13, 5, where the entire church is told, keep your life free from the love of money. And be content with what you have. For he has said, now who's the he? Well, the he would be God in this case. He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The sense is this, when it comes to qualifications for elder, and then also uh, what every Christian should be pursuing in their own life, our security, our contentment, our satisfaction is not found in money. It's not there. It's found in God. Now notice where Paul, in the book of Hebrews, says, um, and don't love money. Why? God says he'll never leave you. He'll take care of you. Now how tempting is it for us to put all of our trust in a, a bank account? To see that when that number gets big, you go, you know what? I feel quite secure. We even call it financial Security. That, that, that is just utter folly. Foolishness. Money cannot save us. Money cannot buy pleasure, contentment, satisfaction. In fact, it can, if abused, lead your heart away from God. Now, can money be used for the great good of God's people? Absolutely. I have been the, the beneficiary of some of the most gracious generous saints that I think God has ever put on the earth. There are saints who you can tell by the way that they live. They love blessing God's people. They don't love their money. That should mark every Christian, but especially an elder. There's another aspect to this, and that is that an elder should not be someone who can be bought. You do not want... Elders making decisions and engaging certain persons in the congregation differently because they're a big giver. That, that, that is one of the reasons why I do not have any idea what anyone gives. I do not want to know. I don't want to know. Elders should not rule differently with people because of what they give. That, that is just... That's sinfulness. That's, James would call that showing sinful partiality. We shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do it. So what are the four negations? He's not a drunkard. He's not violent. He's not verbally abusive or contentious. And he doesn't love money. Second this morning, you might say there were four points. We're 30 minutes in a second. Well, these are, are shorter, I think. Um, the second is an elder's household. Now, these next three will be looking at spheres in their life and say, in this sphere, he must be a mature Christian. In this sphere, he must be a mature Christian. And in this other one. So the first that is mentioned is an elder's 
household. You can see that in verses 4 through 5. Now, some would look at this, and we've said before that I, I don't think that this is the measure of, like a, of, of an extreme uh, category for a super Christian, but some would make it that in my estimation. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. So there would be some who would look at this and say, um, and you can't be an elder if you don't have two or more children. Because if you just have one, it's not plural. Uh, you need two or more. Otherwise, you're not qualified to be an elder. I don't think that's what Paul is saying any more than I think he's saying you have to be married to be an elder. In which case, Jesus and Paul would not qualify. Uh, I don't think he's saying you must have multiple kids to be an elder. In which case, also to our knowledge, Jesus and Paul would not qualify. I, I, I think that is a far too tight, even beyond the general and normal use of language interpretation. I don't think he's saying you have to have multiple kids to serve as an elder. I think what he's saying is, if you have kids, what does home life look like? What, it, what is the church often called in the scriptures? The family, familial language? Okay, well, it would be important. How does a man conduct himself in his own family before he endeavors to rule in God's family? And again, the, the, the correlation is very easy. If you can't rule your own family, you have no business trying to rule over God's. And so what is he to do? Well, it says just quite plainly, he must manage well. Now, many of us would want more details to that. Like, what does it look like? How many times does he do this? How many times does he do this? Paul just says he does it. Well, and I think we could say that Paul is, is advocating that two extremes or two ditches be avoided. The first is that he is not a pushover in his family. You do not want someone sitting in the office of elder whose kids run right over the top of him. Or who, when he comes home, sits in his chair and veges out on the news for hours and is disinterested and disconnected from his family, turns it off and goes to bed. He's not ruling his own family. What will he do with, with the, the church, which is a family? You don't want to push over as an elder. You also don't want a tyrant as an elder. And there would be others who would apply for the office of elder and they treat their family like, like they are a marine squadron. They're, I mean, they are strict, they are harsh, and do, don't ever embarrass me at church mentality. You don't want that man as an elder either. If he is harsh and overly hard or tyrannical or despotic, in his own house, you don't want him as an elder. Now, I'll just say to the dads in the room, you have no right, biblically, to be a pushover or a tyrant. Christ is neither of those. And you're called as a father to mirror him. Is he gentle? He is. Is he firm? Often. <laughs> Does he love and show affection for his family? He does. Do they run right over him? No. That's to be reflected in an elder. Dr. Robert Yarborough says, overtones of both supervision and protection are here. Such an understanding fits well in verse 4, and the context point to measured oversight, not draconian rule or tyranny. He's not a soft-handed man, nor a heavy-handed man. He's a Christ, I don't know, handed sounds weird. He tries to rule his family the way Christ governs his own soul. Uh, the word here is used, uh, just the regular word for children. They're told to be kept in submission. That is, that is don't put any weird meaning into that. It means his children are uh, obeying the rules of the house, that this is a normal 
Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 kind of home. This is a normal Ephesians 5 and 6 kind of home. It says he's to do this with all dignity, and it's, it may not be clear. The ESV seems to make it clear, but maybe you have a different version where it's not clear if dignity is pointing to kids or the dad. The measurement here is of the dad. So I, I don't think, the, I don't think uh, with all dignity points to the children. I think it points to the dad. I think that for a few uh, reasons, one of them is that deacons in the next text are said, and likewise deacons be dignified. You might say, well, like, like what? <laughs> like the elders' kids. No, that's not what it's saying. Be dignified like the elders. Yeah, same standards, same same. Same push, same encouragement. Uh, the women who are mentioned in the text on deacons, whether that's wife or deaconess, we'll get to that later when Pastor Kelly's preaching. And um, they're called to be dignified as well. So I think this is a measurement of, of those serving in the office. I don't think this is a measurement of the kids. The kids are told to be subject to their father. Um, the word for dignity is, is that of seriousness or holiness, and it's used of every Christian. It, we've already run across this term in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, that we may lead a peaceful, quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This should mark every Christian. Every Christian should have a holy soberness to them. Not that we never laugh or enjoy life. Not that at all. That's not seriousness. That's just being a stick in the mud. We're called to love life, but also not be flippant about life. Titus 2 verse 7 says, in all it, Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity and dignity. To summarize, now this is a longer quote, but it's so good I couldn't improve upon it, so I just stole the whole thing. This is from Dr. Yarborough on how a elder should rule his family. He says, of this qualification then is not about a husband cracking the whip at home so that he can bring the same people taming talent to the congregation. It is rather about the love of a father through the gospel for his people, finding full and authentic expression in real, daily, private life of a father and husband as requisite before he is considered for appointment to shepherding God's flock. Key congregational essentials are exercised first in the marriages and home of church members, or it is sheer hypocrisy to depend or to pretend that they exist on Sundays. Forgiveness, care for others, prayer, regard for God's word, self-sacrifice, loving service, respect for others, listening to others, finding joy in what pleases others rather than oneself, making personal changes and forsaking sin for the sake of improved relations with other family members. In many cases, seemingly endless delayed gratification and much more. Paul writes to Timothy to cultivate congregations of real life authenticity, not showcases for religious pretending. This requires big men, not little autocrats. You can see why I stole the whole thing. <laughs> What a description, first, of what elders should be. Second, of what every dad in the church should be. Dads are not to be cracking the whip. Dads are to be faithful, firm, loving shepherds of their home. If you're going to serve in the office of elder, that needs to be there. That is part of mature Christian living. Of the next sphere, well, actually, before we leave that one, there is a debate um, with, I don't want to delve deeply into it. As I've said before, I don't want to get drawn off into Titus's list as opposed to Timothy's list. But many of you have probably heard that um, Titus 1.6 says, uh, an elder's children must be believers. 
that if you're going to serve in the office of elder, all of your kids must be confessing Christians. And some would even go so far as to say that if an adult child walks away, like if you have five kids and one walks away, that you must step down as elder. I do not see that in the text. Um, the word is faithful, uh, which can be, with, in gospel context, believing. Um, in other contexts, it can be what I would say is synonymous with, with what Paul is saying here, that they are faithful to their father, that they are respectful. Um, we could have a long, if you, if you want to have a longer conversation on that, you can come and ask me or Pastor Kelly, but I don't, I don't see that in Paul's list. I don't see it. It's totally absent in Timothy's text, and I think that there are really good explanations as to how to understand it in Titus's text. Uh, number three this morning, an elder's maturity. Verse 6, he must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. So uh, Paul says he cannot be, and you'll even recognize the term, he can't be a neophyte believer. He can't be brand new to the faith. And that, that also, I think, lends itself that this isn't a super Christian list. He's saying that you're actually going to have some younger believers who by God's grace, are showing tremendous sanctification, and you might be tempted because of either their zeal or church need to plug in someone sooner than he should be plugged in. And, and that really is, at times, a temptation in the church. You get a young man who's been saved, showing great strides, maturing in Christ, doing well in all of these categories, and the temptation can be just to just plug him right in. He's been in Christ six months, and let's, let's put him over something. Uh, no, <laughs> we shouldn't do that. We should let time and faithfulness build. Now, does Paul say exactly how long this must be? He doesn't. I sort of wish he did, but he doesn't. He just says, not a recent convert. Now, we can fall, uh, again, into two ditches on this. Um, is there a temptation to plug someone in too early? Yes. I would argue in Reformed Baptist churches, that doesn't tend to be our temptation or the ditch we drive in. We tend to drive in the other ditch. He's been in Christ 30 years, and we're still like, you know, recent convert. <laughs> I don't think that's it either. Somewhere between those where you've shown faithfulness for a time and you live in community and you know your elders and your elders know you and they've walked life with you for the course of some years, I would think. Then you can be examined for that. But sometimes we pretend like you've got to be Moses or Paul before you're ready for this. And I just, I just don't see that. Paul says he can't be a neophyte can't be a brand new umbilical cord bearing Christian. That was more graphic than I thought, but <laughs> childbirth is on the mind. <laughs> he must be <laughs> mature. Let's just move on. Why? <laughs> Why is this to be? He'll fall into condemnation. Now, it's not real clear in the text. It says he could be, uh, he'll fall into condemnation. He'll become puffed up and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Is that the devil who's condemning him? Or is that the same condemnation that the devil himself is condemned with? I don't think it's the, the devil condemning him. Though we know he's the accuser of the brethren, and that could work. But I think the answer is in who became puffed up with conceit and was condemned? Well, the, the devil was. <laughs> He thought he was hot stuff and was condemned by God for it. Sometimes you plug a young man into ministry and he gets a taste for early success and admiration. He can't handle it and becomes puffed up and is condemned just like the devil would be. That's a grievous warning, isn't it? That we not let praise go to our heads. That's why I have faithful deacons who keep that from happening. They tell me all the time I'm not a big deal. It's a mark of their office. They love exercising. So number four, number four, an elder's reputation. 
Look at verse 7. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. Uh, an elder must not be uh, one thing at work and another thing at church. An elder, if, if you have a, uh, a outside employment and one of your coworkers comes to church and you are embarrassed by that or feel like a sink in your stomach, is like, oh, ooh, they're seeing me here and they're used to seeing me there. That's a problem. That's hypocrisy. It's one of the reasons why, like, when, when I came here to King's Cross six years ago, they, they required uh, two, I think it was two recommendations from non-believers that I worked with. So I had to, I had to go to one guy who said he would never darken the door of a church and said, can you fill this out? And another lady who was a Buddhist and said, can you fill this out? And it is important to us that you aren't one thing at work and another thing here. Uh, we did the same for Pastor Kelly when Pastor, Ke Pe when Pastor Kelly was an elder five years ago. We asked, who do you work with? Give them this. We want to know. Now, does that mean that you're never uh, condemned by or ridiculed by the world? No. Like, if you're a faithful Christian and you believe some of the stuff we believe, there will be people in the world who don't like that. That's not what it's asking. It's, it's a guard against um, duplicitous I think that's the right way to say that. Uh, living. Are you a jerk or a cheat at work? Are you verbally abrasive to your coworkers? Is that just for elders, though? No, that's for every Christian. I, I pray that if someone from your workplace came here, you'd be filled with joy and exuberance. Rather than that sinking feeling of like, oh man, I'm going to have to explain some stuff. Um, we hope that that's not, that's not a mature Christian. Why is this a guard? They would not fall into disgrace in the snare of the devil. The lie that you can be one thing out there and something different here needs to be died to. By every Christian, especially of elders. That you could be one way in the world and a different way here. That is hypocrisy. That is a grievous sin that we must all strive to avoid. That, in brief summary, I know it doesn't feel brief at this moment, is how God, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, paints what an elder should be. Now, I want us to, on this side of it, look at two applications for this. The first is that we should pray and plead with God to raise up more such men in our church to serve in this office. We think that this is an absolutely indispensable office for the church, that the health of the church depends upon it, and we should by prayer, seek the Lord that he would do this. Um, I can't tell you the grief that I have seen in other uh, ministers that I know and love when they have a lack of men to serve with. It is absolutely discouraging for them. It will run them into the ground. We should pray that God raise up such men. So th that's one application. Be praying that God do, does this. The second is that we should all be striving to these things as mature Christians. We should all not grow complacent. I, I am very, I'm very concerned when I hear Christians take an approach to their sanctification uh, like some classes in college and seminary that I had. There, I don't know if you've ever had a, a college professor who in the syllabus on the second page said, here's what you do for an A, here's what you do for a B, here's what you do for a C, here's what you do for a D. If you're aiming for an F, get out of my class. So they, they had, it's called like a contract grade. And you would just say, hey, if you wanted a B, it's a five page paper rather than the 10 page paper for the A. And there would be those who would say, you know what, I'm just going to aim for a middle-of-the-road grade. I'm not going to bust it this semester to try to aim for this. 
And I get really concerned, desperately concerned, when Christians take that approach to their life. I'm okay being a B-minus Christian. I, I, you know, I'm not, not great here or there, not great here or there, but, you know, I, I cut above some and worse than others. That should not be our approach. Our approach should be striving for Christ-likeness with gentleness and graciousness for one another. Like, that's where we should be growing. And so, in a loving way, confronting one another on things like quarreling in grace. Why? Because you're annoyed? No, because you see it as a sin that is holding a brother or sister back. We should grow in these things. We should strive in these ways with each other. We should encourage one another to these ways. Not just rebuking, but encouraging one another as each day goes that we would not be the same place in our sanctification a year from now as we are today. Shouldn't we want to grow in these things, church? We should want to strive for these things. Because it makes you a five-star Christian as opposed to a four? No, because this is what our Savior is like. Because we want to be like Him. Because we're grieved by the sin that we see in our own life. And we want it to die. And we want to live to Christ. That's why we should want to grow. Please don't divorce your life of Growth and sanctification from the person and work of Jesus Christ. I know it, it almost makes nonsense to say that plainly, but we do it. If you want to stop growing, say it a different way. Say, I, I am close enough to Christ. Thank you. I don't want more. And you hear what a horrible thing that is. If we love the Savior, we should, be want, to, we should want to be conformed more into his likeness and image. Are we going to fail at this? Yes, a whole lot. Is there abundant grace and mercy and strength for the pursuit of him? Yes, there is. But please don't round off the corners of what God calls us to. Don't excuse it away. Don't redefine it. Don't rename it. Strive after Christ in every area of life. And by his grace and by his spirit, you will look back over the years and you will see growth. Sometimes we get so microscopic, we look at, you know, the last hour. You're like, I am not growing in the Lord. Well, not measurably in that hour, maybe. But if you look back over months and years and, God willing, decades, you can see his grace at work in your life. Shaping, cutting away crafting and molding us more into his likeness and his image for his glory. Let's pray. Father, please be at work in our lives to shape and mold Christ in us. Father, none of us can make it through that list without seeing areas where we fall short. We pray that you would Lovingly, gently walk with us along this life. We pray that you would raise up elders from this church that would serve in this office for the good of your bride. We pray that you would raise up each congregation member to grow in these things. That we would all grow into the mature portion of Christ that you have for us. We pray that as we confront these things in our own hearts and minds, God, that you would encourage us by your table, that you would encourage us that you and you only have the strength and the grace that we need. We pray this in our Savior's name. Amen.